Dr. Anu Agri Symposium, which started yesterday, a presentation by Dr. Christoph Lobo. Uh, let me point your attention that uh, we have several, uh, several events taking place today. Post a presentation in Manu Power. We have a series of colloquia in the faculty lounge and of course another presentation here. We start off today with a presentation by one of our most recognized and uh, prestigious scholar, Dr. Phila Fountain. I must say myself that the last year and a half I've been learning a lot from him from, for, about religious context, how to say the right thing and how, how to put the right things in the right perspective. It's a pleasure for me to welcome Phila Fountain. Well, of course, I'm very glad to be back. I feel like I'm home since I teach classes in here, right, you know? Uh, so it's great, but good to be with you. And I'm very glad to continue our series in the Gould Lecture Series. Uh, it's wonderful that we can kind of envelope this uh, academic symposium and back end and front end the symposium with uh, the Gould Lectures. I think that's a very good development, good movement. Thanks to those who were able to pull that off. Uh, but yesterday in chapel, I tried to accentuate the question of identity. I think it's really important for us to think deeply about that question, and especially as it relates to religious identity. And that's where I want to go. I know that language like religious or spiritual can be overladen with a lot of you know, connotations, right? It denotes certain things, but it also connotes a number of things depending on the context. Religious, spiritual, I don't like the word spiritual, I think it's kind of squishy, doesn't really mean much, has to be defined, you know, quite a bit. Maybe religious does too, maybe I'm just fooling myself, you know? But all language has to be defined in some way. So yesterday we talked about identity, I wanted to accentuate that, I talked about the social circumstances in which a religious or self-identity could emerge. Just to highlight that. And then we talked about some social problems or factors that might challenge the uh, formation of stable, durable, and pervasive self-identities. We kept it at that level. Certainly psychology informs that. Uh, sociology has a factor in this. So I really thought about this idea of social psychology and those developments, the cultural developments, that might impinge on that question of identity. We talked about uh, differentiation, segmentation of our culture. We talked about um, rationalization. Ever since the, you know, the uh, rise of science and modernity, right, the idea that we ought to think in rational, instrumental ways, and that as that pervades a culture, what happens to religion? Because in some ways, religion doesn't utilize the tools of, of scientific methodology and rationality at least as fundamental expression of its religious faith. Oh, we do integrate and use it as a tool in some way, but it's kind of disciplined, right? You know, we spank science on the behind and rationality behind and say, you need to do what we say you need to do, right? You know, and so there's a lot of dialogue about that. We'd like to share my own views about that sometime. And then we talked about secularization. So we've got this process in our culture of now rationalization and differentiation that some of the older scholars claimed there was this inevitable process of secularization, that everybody in America, as this process of social process continues, that religion will die out, magic will die out, religion will die out, you know, the supernatural, the fantastic, right? And gradually we become this bureaucratic, uh, organized society, uh, organized by instrumental reason, and uh, everything will be an efficient expression of that individual reason. And I mentioned yesterday that Max Weber was afraid of that. He was alarmed at that. Who wants to live in that kind of iron cage? Right? And I, I, I tell you, when I was reading his material, I kind of resonated with that. A little amen here or there, right, you know? Yeah. Um, and then we talked about pluralism, which is just a social fact. And its effects on consciousness, which is uh, kind of um, this uh, relativism, right? That if everybody believes all these things, then this, how can we judge them and they're kind of all equal in some way, right, you know? And then I mentioned, I took a poke at my colleagues uh, and myself as well, uh, it's the academics who are secular, right? 
because we live in that realm all the time of reason and rationality, but the world is as religious as it ever was, and it's getting more religious in some way. And I think I want to take that seriously and ask, well, why? Why is this in America is the secularization thesis not working out as expected by some of the older scholars, and why is religion so vital? But before we get there, we have to talk about what religious identity is. So we're going to piggyback on this idea of self-identity, okay? And I don't have any nice pictures like I had yesterday in chapel, but this is kind of serious for me. I have to be honest with you. So I'm going to bring the tone down a little bit, and because uh, this is really critical for me. I have given my life to do whatever I can, blood, sweat, whatever, to encourage and to work with God and the Holy Spirit to shape and form vital Christian identities that actually look like Jesus in some way, right, you know? And that matters to me. Uh, you know, I've given my life over to that. Everything I do in life, everything, in my family, and uh, here at ENC, and, and uh, outside in the world, it's all subordinated to, relative to, uh, this promotion, this encouragement of what I would call holiness identities. And I'll go to the mat on that, you know? I'll go round and round with somebody, and I have, with love, of course, you know? Because this is critical for us. I don't know how you read the B.I.B.L.E., yeah, that's the book for me, but when I read the B.I.B.L.E., the book for me, I see nothing but holiness, right? That's all there is. And I just find it amazing that somebody else can find something different, right? I mean, what, what, what glasses are they wearing, right? You know, these sort of glasses. Okay, enough preaching. I get that off my chest. I feel better about myself now, you know. And we're going to move on. So what I'm talking about today is, is theology and social psychology. I have to warn you. Um, I mean, I could go on for days and days. I do have somebody keeping time here, right, you know, and we'll ring the bell. But when your eyes glaze over and your head falls back, I'll take that as a clue to stop, all right? Because um, I just keep on going. This is important to us, right? So I want to talk today about ingredients of religious identity. Ingredients or factors of religious identity, what it might look like. So there are some assumptions out there. And one primary one is religion, we know it when we see it, right? Religious identity, well, I'll recognize it when it comes along. And that's fine and good. I don't mind that to a certain extent. But when we do research, when we think critically about these things, we've got to have some sense of what we're looking for. The world is crazy out there. It's an empirical, chaotic mess, right? And human beings are trying to bring some order to it, you know? But it's crazy out there. And we need to know what we're looking for. So a theory is just a gut, right? And it's, a, it's, it's tentative, it's kind of preliminary, it gives us some direction, some sense of what we're looking for, that's what we want to do. So here's some of the problems that I see. First, a lot of social and psychological research uh, on identity has been done without a clear understanding of what religious identities are and how they're formed. It's kind of out there floating around, the assumption that we'll know it when we see it, you know? And in the church, there's also a, a challenge or a problem. Confusion over the nature of religious or spiritual identity. Assumptions that identity is only or purely, catch that, okay, the product of the supernatural, miraculous work of God, immediate and unmediated by social structures that results in a Gnostic-like religious life in which religion and social institutions like the church are disconnected. It's only what I do in my spirit, right, you know? It's my spirit on that. And we as Nazarenes, we got caught up in that for a while. We're kind of like these Gnostic Christians where I got saved in my spirit or my head, but my body really didn't matter, right, you know? So I could do all kinds of crazy things in my body, but it didn't affect my spirit, nor my standing with God. And as I read scripture, that's pretty problematic. And now I'm gonna, I almost got to preaching there for a moment, right? You know, so it might spill out. I'm a preacher at heart, you know, so it's gonna spill out once in a while. But here's my beef. Ecclesiology, what we do in church on Sunday morning or whenever we gather together as God people. So ecclesiology and religious identity have little if any relation. It's like church is a holding tank, right? Well, it's just a place I go, and then God does all this stuff. Now, do I believe? in a, a, a divine work of God and the Holy Spirit? Of course I do. But as I read 
scripture, then I see something else going on here. Because that's a guide for me, right? A primary guide for me. So I want to talk about that. How does ecclesiology and religious identity, what are the, the relationships? I'm going to talk about some of the ingredients. <clears throat> and I want to talk about, sorry, religious identity as a feature or an aspect of self-identity. We talked about that yesterday. I've got my uh, suspenders on, indicating symbolic to me that I'm a grandfather now. My son, Tim, and his wife, lovely wife, just had a baby five days ago, right? You know, Victoria Rose, right? a three-time grandfather, right? You know, good days for me. You know, this reminds me, right, that, hey, I'm a grandfather, and I need to play that role. And I, folks, I, I, I want to be a virtuoso in that, right, that role. I want to be the best possible grandfather anybody can be, right, you know? And, uh, and I, that's what I want to do, part of my identity that I want to accentuate, right, you know? And I've talked about other changes in myself. But that's only sort of an object lesson or a prompting. What is identity? <coughs> what does it look like? What's it smell like? What's it taste like? And that's where I want to go. So it's an aspect of self-identity. That's a claim. I can't justify that right now. A lot of research does do that. And if you're interested in a name, Nancy Emmerman, my doctoral advisor at VU, uh, offers some strategy for that. So we want to talk then about self-identity, a start there at the beginning, self-identity as the result of the interplay between <coughs> agency and structure. Agency and structure. Pretty general, isn't it? Kind of abstract. All that means is here's a me, here's an I, and I exist in a social structure, and I, my actions then are a result of the interaction between the me, between the I, and the broader culture. So who I am is actually created, constructed in dialogue with you, right? I am a different person having met you. Every social location shapes us in some way, influences us. I want to talk about that more. So agency and structure, the person or the individual and the broader social structure, all identity and self-identity is this conversation going back and forth. So then self-identities, how are they formed? They are formed through interaction and conversation with others. Kind of simple, isn't it, you know? I mean, you got to have a PhD to, to work with that stuff? No, you do not, right? It's kind of a basic observation, right, you know? We kind of get that. It's kind of intuitive, right, you know? I'm La Fountain. We told La Fountain stories growing up, you know? And we had episodes of La Fountainism all over the place, right, you know? And I was shaped in that context. That's my primary socialization, but I probably will never really change much at all. That goes deep, deep into your psyche, right, you know? those first four, five, six, seven years of your life. We might be born with some kind of uh, basic personality structure, you know, um, but I'm not an essentialist. I don't believe there's some essence when we're born of ourselves and it flowers over time and, you know, we have discovered that, you know, I think it's a book, to be honest with you, right, you know? And, you know, and then your mother tells you, oh, honey, you're so special and unique, you know, and you're different from other kids and stuff, you know? That's what mothers do. They lie to us to make us feel better, right? You know? So, yeah, you can it to your mind, but to the rest of Homo sapiens, probably not, right? You know? So, self identities that are formed in this interaction, socialization process within particular social structures. You know, I see most of you, if not all of you, are wearing kind of typical American garb, you know, in some way. Uh, well, that's kind of, you're, you're kind of conforming to our social society, right, you know? So in this interplay between the structure and the individual or the agent, agency, I'm an agent, you know, a moral agent, I can do certain things with my body, talk and act and think, right, you know? Agency and structure, agency and structure, there are two poles, if you will. The first is this ascribed identity. To, be, to have an ascribed identity is one that culture tells you you will have this identity. This is what you are going to be, right? And it's, although not an exact analogy, it's like the Middle Ages, like with Catholicism, shaped and formed social structures, and you were born, you, and you died, you were raised, you died within that ecclesial church structure, you know, and you gained your identity from that. Other kinds of closed social communities 
in which there aren't very many possibilities for multiple identities to emerge, right? It's kind of one or two at the most, and then you, you just assume those are the right ones, right, you know? And you take that identity on. That's ascribed in, in a closed, kind of traditional society, and there's very little choice. Now, see how I put choice in scare quotes, right? That's important. Choice, we as Americans, oh, we love choice, right, you know? We gotta have choice, right, you know? Not having choice is a bad thing. Why? Why? It doesn't seem necessary to me to think about why choice is better, you know, or worse than not having a, uh, uh, choices or options, right? So our assumptions betray us when we jump to conclusions or think critically, right? So not necessarily a bad thing. We have to find out what those identities are looking like, right? What kind of identity then emerges out of a closed system and investigate that and think critically about it, you know? So that's one poll. These are probably like ideal types. There's probably nothing like that out in the real world, but they help us make sense of the real world, right? You know? And then there are achieved identities, much more like our culture in which ourselves are created and constructed by us. They're achieved. In often in open and pluralistic environments like ours, we are forced to make decisions. We're forced to create ourselves. And we have superfluous choice, right? More choice than we can choose in any way, right? So it's over and above and beyond. And again, that's not really America because there are a lot of constraints. Even in our open society, there are a lot of constraints and limitations. There aren't going to be very many cat men in our society. Not many Barbie women in our society, right? And certainly not many Lafountains, right, you know? as we get there. Maybe, we, maybe that's okay, maybe that's a good thing, right? So between these two poles, folks, between these two poles, you have created an identity, a self-identity, between those two poles. Some have a little more choice, others because of circumstances have restricted choice in creating or forming an identity. And we'll talk maybe some about that sometime, right? So we're thinking about identity as an aspect of self-identity, religious identity, and uh, many scholars and sociologists, and I think this is so fortuitous, at the same time religion is thinking deeply about the role of narrative and story and forming identity, guess what? So also is sociology of religion, right? And sociology of identity. That narrative is a very fortuitous development. And that may be, for religion, in American culture, Oh, that might be a wonderful opportunity for us to, to set religion free from the bondage of sectorization <coughs> and church sectarianism in the old school. The book I'm working on, Changing Identity, is, I hope, a, a call to set religion free. Many scholars have reduced religion to a dependent variable, that religion is merely the cause of some material effects, right? You know, kind of like Marx, a little bit that Karl Marx says, consciousness is the result of social structure, you know, in a kind of a general way. Although I think there's more dynamic going on there, you know, or it's, it, or it's deprivation. People seek religion because they're deprived of some material resource. No, they are not, right? Religion is an independent variable. That means it can work and function in the world without being dependent on anything else, right? That's a fundamental principle. And I'll go to the mat on that as well, you know? Now, can fu religion function as an independent variable? Oh, yeah. yeah. When you get prejudice, discrimination, you get churches that are all one race or one... For understanding the nature of self-identity. Cognitive science, in a general way, tells us that we don't think in propositions. We don't think in facts. We don't think in datum, right? We think in images. We think imagistically. You know, you might put that, we might we think in metaphors, right, you know? You actually have to make yourself think in instrumental logic. In fact, you have, to, that's, you have to learn that. Human beings had to create it and learn it, right, as a function of human thinking. And it was created by the Greeks, right, what, five, six hundred years before Jesus was born. So, but our default position is we think in images or metaphors. Guess what? An extended metaphor? It's a narrative, right? It's a story. So that's how we think. If you, if you ask me, hey, Phil, who are you? 
I'm going to start telling you episodes from the events of my life. I'm going to tell you a story. Well, my father's name was Lawrence. My mother's name was Jane. I grew up in upstate New York. I got two peas stuck up my nose one time. I couldn't get them out to go to the hospital. You know, I tried to call under a, a road and a pipe and got stuck. And my brother laughed at me, made fun of me, left me there for three hours, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, if you don't know those episodes about my life, you don't know who Phil LaFountain is. And I'll bet you, you've got some stories to tell, too, that have shaped who you are, right? Of course, you want to talk about influential people, ideas that might have shaped you in some way. So I'm building upon that insight from cognitive science. Margaret Summers suggests that there are four layers of narrative when we think about human identity, self-identity. First of all, there's the autobiographical narrative. Right? The story that I tell about myself, it's up here. It's my inner voice, right? It's the self that, that, well, it's not the self I project always. It's the self that I believe I am, right? Because there are times when I project only what I want to project, right? We put masks on, faces on. So if you take a class with me, like East meets West or, or Emi's, you know, I'm projecting myself. I'm playing a social role. You know, I'm behaving certain social rules, but that's not me per se, right? Get me at home, you know, get me out in the garden, you know, get me in my work clothes, get me on my motorcycle, put the tap down my Miata, let me get out there a little bit, you know, and you might see more of who I am. Now, I hope all of those are Christian, by the way. I think they are. I want them to be. But, you know, to see one small part of a person's life is not to know them in the fundamental way. And I'm not going to essence here, but it's a story that I tell. I know I'm not you. I know I'm not you. I'm not you, not you, not you, not you. I'm not you, not you. So I know there's a distinction and difference. Difference isn't bad, right? Difference is not bad. It's not a, it's not a four-letter word, <laughs> to be honest with you, as some people think it is, right? Difference is not bad. It depends on how, what you do with difference. Uh, that's what matters. So I have an autobiographical narrative that I tell about myself, right? But it's not an essence. I'm not an essentialist. I don't believe there's some essence or core to our identity that we got from uh, some source and that's kind of working out in life. And if I'm in problems in life, I've got to discover who I am by going away to some cave or some remote place on an island and, you know, take my journal and write down my little journal thoughts about stuff, you know. I don't believe that anymore. I just don't. I, I think my identity is really what happens when we're together, you know, and especially when we're together as church. Oh, yeah. That's where my identity is really formed, right, you know? So uh, public narratives, these are the ones that institutions like uh, ENC, right, it tells. We tell a story, and we're telling a story about who we are academically and, and religiously and, and uh, uh, intellectually, you know? Churches also tell stories. Local congregations tell stories. And bowling clubs tell stories. Baseball clubs tell stories. Chess clubs tell, tell stories, right? Everybody's telling a story if they're a social organization about who they are. So, and uh, our denomination tells stories as well, right? About uh, what it means to be religious, what it means to be Christian. You know, a host of stories out there. If I want to become a world-class bowler and uh, bowl learn how to bowl 300 games, I'm not going to go to somebody who's got a 45 average. <laughs> you know? I'm going to apprentice myself. I'm going to join a social group called the bowling club, and I'm going to learn, right, how to, what, how to roll the ball, how to get a nice curve, how to hit the pocket every time. I want to practice, 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 until I'm really good at it. And that master, that, uh, that guy, that mentor, that, or, or woman that I... Uh, submit myself to is going to teach me and critique me, maybe even yell at me a little bit, you know. No, LaFountain, you're doing it wrong, right, you know. Kind of like your coach at ENC, right, you know. Uh, that, teaching you this. Well, without taking serious the story of the body, the, uh, the marks, the scars, the way we look, the way we act, our attitudes and our dispositions, all of that, the whole package of what it means to be uh, in the body, right, matters to God. And we'll talk about that. So, <clears throat> all right. So identities then, a self-identity, emerges, is produced and shaped and constructed out of the everyday intersections between the autobiographical narrative and the public narratives that we encounter every day. Now, some of those public narratives don't really mean much to us, and others will, 
especially as they are shared and carried by significant others. Those that we, we esteem to be very important to us, right? You know, they're those mentors and family members and teachers and professors and, and colleagues and students, right? You know, that they matter to us, so their stories kind of stand out for us, and we might integrate features of their stories into our story. You've already done that, folks. As soon as you came into this room, you carried with you your story, right? You're living it out. You're embodying that in some way, right? So every social situation, every social situation we encounter has a story. A public narrative shaped by culture and institutions with powerful persons and prescribed roles establishing the plot, the story. You can play the whole novel idea out, right? You know, characters and plots and the, uh, the narrator and characters in it, you know. In Bible, God is not the narrator. I find that interesting. Read the Old Testament. God is a character in the story. The narrator is quite a fascinating persona in that. You can learn a lot spiritually, right? From looking at scripture, mostly Old Testament, New Testament too, where the narrator is quite an interesting persona, right? But it's not God. Very fascinating. All right, so two key characteristics. First of all, events are structured and constructed, and we have to pay attention to intersectionality then. So events, everything is structured. This right now is a structured event. It's been organized. There are certain things. We're not going to start playing basketball, not going to start playing soccer. We're not going to do much experimentation. Sorry, my friend, you know. You know, this, it's structured and constrained. There are things that we will not do in this room right now, and if we did it, it would be really strange, right, you know? He's got a croquet set. What's he doing here, right, you know? Because those rules aren't at play right now, all right? Um, pay attention to intersectionality. So when we think about what identities are formed, how do these two intersect? This idea of autobiographical narrative and the stories at play. And we'll talk about that. Then actions arise out of the multiple public narratives available to modern actors. All right, so for locating religious identity. We talked about self-identity. We talked a bit about religious identity, but let's locate these religious identities. They don't, they don't happen willy-nilly, right? If self-identity is formed through structured events, then so also is religious identity structured by, uh, uh, formed by structured events, circumstances, gatherings that are social in some way. So where are religious identities formed? Well, they're formed in any social inter interaction in which social episodes are implotted in a religious narrative. We tell stories, we implot them in a religious story, we get from B.I.B.L.E., that's the book for me or wherever we might get that from, and in which religious actors like gods and angels and demons and other, you know, supernatural beings, right, you know, have a play in our story where ideas, institutions, experiences play a key role in the story of who we are and who I am. An interaction takes on a religious character when it directly invokes the co-participation of a transcendence or sacred other invoking a narrative in which they play a role. Sorry, you might want to see that a little longer. So when I'm in a social situation where we start talking about God, hey, what do you think? How are you doing as a Christian today? You know, is Jesus still the Lord of your life right now? Yeah, you know, might be at work, might be at the zoo, you know, who knows where it might be. But any encounter where religious language ideas are invoked and uh, sacred others are, are, are called upon, right? You know, we talk about that. Some of them are ad hoc, some of them are planned, you know. Suppose I have an evangelism strategy, or I'm going to knock on someone's door, knock, knock, knock. Oh, hello, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you know? And you go through the whole sh spiel there, right, you know? So they can be organized plans, planned. But for the most part, for the most part, Explicit social organizations are places where society has institutionalized an expectation that religious interaction will take place. Eastern Nazarene College, right? It's not, it's not Eastern Baptist College. Nothing against Baptists. I love them, right? You know? Nothing. It's not Eastern Catholic College or East Eastern Lutheran College or whatever. It's Eastern Nazarene College. So that's a social clue, right? That's a clue to, to say that when you come to ENC, guess what, folks? You're going to be permeated by and inundated by 
Nazarendom, right? You're, you're entering into social space in which in some way, supposedly, some way, that somehow something Nazarene is going to flourish and whirl around and shape and form identities. While, so we're giving people a clue. Hey, you want to have a Nazarene identity? Come to ENC. And we then have churches, local congregations, in which the same kind of social expectation occurs, right? And our, for some reason... The way religion is formed in America is either a movement, a protest movement, pushing that back against something, or a denomination. Something like a denomination is really the only way, the only way that religion is, lives or exists in American society. Why? That's a curious question to me. Why is it something like denominations that occur almost every time, right? And we can track those. So institutions are important, and the primary site for religious experience and for the construction of religious identity, congregations, Eastern Nazarene College, as I mentioned before. So these institutions are suppliers of public narratives, and they trigger for you. Hey, you come here, come to this Baptist church, and we're going to expect that you become a Baptist, right? Or Lutheran, or Episcopal, or whatever it might be. These are social clues, and that's a good thing. That's a great thing, right? Because here in this space, our narrative and our practice will be related to our story. They create widespread spread public arenas in which religious action can occur. They supply structured religious biographical narratives. For example, the saved sinner, you know, the holy person, the pilgrim, the sanctified person, within which the actor's own biographical narrative can be experienced. So when I go into a Nazarene church and they talk to me about the sanctified person, now my own autobiographical story can begin to interact with that broad general narrative. So I start listening to it, hearing episodes. I, I discern the plot, the story. And in that community, an exemplar emerges. You know, the ideal person. What does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus described as, you know, the saved sinner, holy person, the sanctified person or whatever, right? We all hold do that, right? That's a part of what it means to be church and to, uh, to be a part of a social group called the ecclesia or the church. So, um, how are we doing? Okay on time? I can spill over a little bit? Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, religious organizations then establish narratives through their elaborate sets of roles, Myths, in a, don't be afraid of that term, myths in a general sense, right? Stories that we tell about God and that sort of thing, right, you know? Rituals and behavior prescriptions that encourage participants to perceive sacred others as their co-participants in life. I love that, right? So when I go to church, I expect to, that God would be a part of my life, right? That I'll enter into a relationship with Jesus, I'll sing songs, I'll pray, you know, all of that is telling story and ritual and uh, behaviors. And when I go to church, I'm expected to behave in a certain way. Especially if you go to a holiness church, right? You are to behave in holy ways. Not just for one hour on Sunday, but for through the week. But I'm expected to live in that kind of way. The story and the practices that are part of it shape and form who I am, right? It becomes my identity. I live into that story. And I appropriate it in community. This is not me alone, right? In community. So uh, religious organizations establish grammars for the stories people tell about the world. All social institutions, every single one, tells a story, imply and shape a particular identity. They want to shape you in some way, right? And there are no exceptions. And uh, I was in uh, Professor uh, Monte Williams' class the other day. We talked about this, and I waffled on this, right? You know, about neutral space. I, I, may, maybe out in the desert, there might be some neutral space, right? You know, I don't know. But for the most part, I want to say, that every social group has expectations about an identity and that want to influence in that way. Thus, be aware. You know, so when you join a church or when you join some club, you are going to be shaped in some way and you're going to be changed. Do you want to change that way? Is that what you want to become? So very carefully investigate that group, that social group, right? 
uh, it's important for us because it has a powerful way to shape and form our imaginations. So identity then is formed, religious identity, through social interaction with particular religious institutions and key concepts, religious narratives, and embodied practices. If we have great narratives but no practices, not much can happen. Right? Or people create their own practices. Or they conflate it with other narratives, right? You know? So in a social location, how can we influence the formation of holy identities? You got it. I know I kind of cut off in the middle. But Prof, tell us more about religious identities, you know? Yeah, I know you're on, I know you're on the edge of your seat. I know you're just right on the edge of your seat and you just can't wait until chapel tomorrow what I'll wear and uh, what I'll look like, but also what I'm going to say, okay? And, but, you know, it's good to keep people in suspense, right, you know? So, um, yeah, questions, thoughts, concerns? You want to you wanna ask some questions? Stacy, anything on your mind? No? <laughs> okay, no, I guess not, okay, all right. So, does this, sound, does this make sense? Is it plausible? I'm, I, I'm, you got the mic? I'm going to take you back too far, maybe, to, to but... Regression but therapy, no. all the way back to my yeah, childhood, maybe? Exactly. All right. No, or to one of your early claims uh, that about religious, religion as an independent... Thing. Yes, yeah. And all of <clears throat> just as quick, I mean, as succinctly as you can, <clears throat> I suppose, but how do we know? Like, I couldn't, I can't think of an example that would demonstrate to me that religion operated as an independent variable. Oh, no? Oh, what am I... I was going to give you a dollar. I was going to give you a dollar. Okay. You know? So, can I borrow a dollar from you? And I'll pay, I promise I'll pay you back, okay? All right. Because I love you, my brother, I'm going to give you a dollar. All right? Thanks. Now, what caused me to do that? An act of love. My belief in Jesus Christ. Okay. Right? Faith. Right? That's what I mean by that. It wasn't because, necessarily because I saw that you were poor, yeah. right, you know? Or because somehow my material culture prompted my identity to emerge to offer to you this resource here, right, you know? It wasn't economically driven. It wasn't even rationally driven. I, it wasn't instrumental reason. I'm not, it's not quid pro quo. I'm not, you know, if I give him a dollar today, he might give me 10 next week, <laughs> you know? It's, it's nothing, no return. It's a pure act, right? Or if I'm reading my scripture and God says, go and love your neighbor as yourself, right? and I go out, I'm driving down the road, and somebody wants to cut me off, you know, I act Christianly, I kind of pull back a little bit, you know, motivated by my faith, that understanding of God's love for me, right, you know, and how God, you see what I'm trying, that's an independent variable, right, you know, and it's not because I'm deprived in some way, not because you're deprived in some way, right, you know, you want to give that dollar back? No. No, okay. <laughs> all right, so, does that make sense at all? Just yeah. illustration, there's more to say about that, you know, but um, Rodney, ah, um, oh, no! Sociologist, uh, it'll come to me in a minute, right, you know, who's doing a lot of work today in religion as an independent variable, who basically argued that the only way, the only way Christianity could have overcome Roman culture yeah. is... Stark. Yes, thank you, Rodney Stark, right? Rodney Stark, a great sociologist, giving me a lot of theory to push back against secularists, right, you know, and materialist, a lot of good stuff there and a lot of good empirical research to justify his theory there. Good. Other thoughts? I know you're burning. At the beginning, you talked about achievements and ascribed identity. Yes. You never talked about religious identity until much later. So where does okay. Fit? So if self-identities, the question is, I talked about achieved, or, or, sorry, ascribed identity that's dictated to you by culture and uh, then achieved where you have to, you know, it's a protean, Herculean kind of task to become that, right? You know, exerting all great social effort to become that identity, right? Within those two poles, so if it's true for social identity, it's also true for religious identity. Religious identities can be ascribed, right? You know, you're, 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 you're Mormon, right? You know, you're Catholic or you're Nazarene or you're Baptist, and that's all you can be, right? Where social circumstances limit your choice in your religious identity. Then the other side is purely ascribed. If we live in a deeply and powerfully pluralistic environment, and in which there are multiple religions, or even if we live in a secular environment, right? And I want to be religious, man, I've got an uphill battle. I've got to 
I got to take upon myself the the you know the initiative to to create that and tell stories and form myself, and I got to maintain that every day by myself. Like Catman or a Barbie woman, right? You know, I mean, she's got to recreate the identity every single day. And the only way he or she can maintain that identity is through changing her physic physicalness, right? You know, she looks like Barbie. She he looks like Catman, right? That is a way for them to sustain and maintain that identity in context. So how do we maintain our own religious identities? Through community. How do we keep a holy identity fresh in our consciousness. How do we continue practicing those practices? Because it's reinforced in community. Every time I get together, we tell the great stories of the faith. We have a great question through self-reflection, you know, um, uh, talking with others and dialoguing, you know. Uh, uh, it doesn't always have to be purely cause and effect or instrumental rationality. You don't need a syllogism or a mathematical formula to do religion, right? So. Just yeah. one more. Uh, ladies, miss, you go ahead. Uh, so what are some of the other forms of speaking? You've been yeah. saying like the rationalism and... Yeah, so uh, maybe, maybe family tradition. Uh, historical traditions, cult uh, cultural traditions that aren't necessarily the working out of some uh, syllogism or some kind of a, uh, basic rational premise that works out. Religion, right? Faith, belief, believing that, uh, that scripture is revelation in some way and that the Holy Spirit comes upon us and empowers us. These are ways that uh, modes of human thinking and reflection and behavior that stand outside the purely, the purely rational, right? Although today most of us kind of there's a dialectic between them, right? You know, but what happened in modernity is that that only one, that only one, only only that one form was uh, uh, lifted up as the only way to judge and adjudicate uh, spiritual religious truth. So the history of theology, the history of modern theology, is basically a history of negotiating away <laughs> of the Christian faith, right? Well, you take the Genesis accounts, but we'll keep the resurrection, right? Well, you take the miracles, but we'll keep these other parts of faith, right? What we're realizing now is that you can't do away with hardly anything, right? That's, it's, that, that's our revelation for us, right? That it still speaks to us in some way without recourse necessarily to uh, historical methodology or, or scientific rationality or mathematical formulas, right? And we're, it's, it's interesting to me because We've been sh so shaped by rationality we we've, that our imaginations have become shriveled. We can no longer imagine those other ways of being in the world. I'm glad to say that those other ways of being in the world are uh, finding a resurgence. And I celebrate that, to be honest with you. I celebrate that with great gusto. Okay. But I love science, too. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you.